Thank you to the MSA Coalition for uh, you know helping put this uh, wonderful conference together. I hope it's uh, useful for all of you in, in some way. Um, so uh, the first session that we're going to have this morning is going to consist of um, three 15-minute uh, medical talks. Uh, and then we'll have a, um, a longer Q&A to uh, you know, answer all the questions you have. Um, so our first speaker is uh, Dr. Lori Siang, and uh, she's one of our excellent movement disorder neurologists. She works with uh, Dr. Poston, um, who spoke yesterday, and she's going to speak on um, sort of the uh, treatment of the movement uh, symptoms in uh, MSA. Uh, Dr. Yang. So thank you so much for having me. Um, I was here yesterday and today. Hi, can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah, I like walking around. <laughs> this one? Yeah. Hello? Oh, so great. <laughs> so um, great. Um, so I was here yesterday, and I was I'm so impressed um, with the amount of people that are here today. I mean, what a crowd! I think the one thing definitely I left with yesterday, and I will be leaving today, is that this community that we're building here, whether it be locally, nationally, even internationally, I mean, you're not alone. You're not alone in terms of support, um, healthcare providers, the expertise from all over the world. So it, I think it was really quite inspiring. Um, from yesterday's and I hope you continue to be inspired today. So today what I want to talk a little bit more about is kind of going over what Dr. Poston did yesterday and I'm just going to kind of continue it on um, today. She really talked a lot about uh, what MSA is and I think you know you guys are, know very much so that MSA is kind of a combination of Parkinsonism plus this early significant autonomic dysfunction. She talked a lot about what MSA P is an MSAC. It just means basically what is the first symptom that comes on. So MSAP has more Parkinson's. MSAC has more kind of the cerebellar kind of ataxia. So she went on, you know, talk a little bit about the definition and talked a little bit more also about the symptoms that come on with it. So that's kind of a lot. What I want to do today is really kind of break it down a little bit. And actually, what we're going to do in this panel today is talk a little bit more about the practical ways practical treatments um, that can go uh, from tre um, treating these symptoms. She also talked a little bit about the importance of knowing who your team is. And that's very important, because there is no one person that's going to be able to do all of this. For example, be a neurologist and your cardiologist and your GI doctor and also your physical therapist. That's not uh, having that important team um, is very um, essential in terms of your treatment. Now, when it comes to what I'm going to talk to you about is the movement disorder part. So the movement disorder is how do we, um, the main question I want to answer for you today is what is my algorithm? What is my checklist when I take care of someone with MSA to make sure I am hitting all the most important points, especially with motor symptoms? What you're going to see today is one, I'm going to go over the motor symptoms and my colleagues will also go over the autonomic systems, um, the up and down of the blood pressures. Um, my other colleagues are going to talk about sleep. We're also going to talk about mood as well as therapy and the importance of a social support system. Um, so first, what I want to talk about is the motor symptoms. So the motor symptoms that's most common um, in MSA is kind of the slowness, the stiffness, um, we call it Parkinson-like symptoms. Now these Parkinson uh, symptoms can have problems with fine motor movements, kind of this feeling of in trouble initiating the movement. Um, one of my um, uh, patients kind of said it, and I thought it was a very good description, was that it feels like you can do it, you can move the, the hand, but instead of being up in the air, kind of normal um, movements, it feels like your hand is underground, uh, not underground, underwater. So it's like that kind of resistance that you feel. So it's a, uh, so that stiffness, slowness um, is the motor symptom that we want to treat in MSA. There are two medicines we tend to use. One of them is carbidopa, levodopa. Um, uh, that's the first one we try. Sometimes it doesn't work as well, but we always try it, as well as amantadine. Amantadine is another one. Also can help with the slowness and stiffness, but also can really help with more of the ataxia, more of the, the gait as well. 
Um, in addition to that, when you think of motor symptoms, one of the biggest things I emphasize that's very important is very early on physical therapy. And now the reason why is what kind of obvious stuff to maintain mobility, maintain that flexibility, and you always want to do it really early on. Even in addition to that, you always want to have very good um, wheelchair as well as walker um, assessments. You know, it's not, they're not, they need to be customized for your height, um, your, for your use. In addition to to that the importance of regular exercise even if you did five minutes an hour that's that that is so important it's not only just making you more flexible and reducing you know likelihood of falls and reducing deconditioning but really actually the most important is that we found out over time that in mouse models we think that exercise can actually decrease the progression of neurodegenerative diseases and that's really important because as of right now there are no medications that do that. There's no medications that we are, we're looking for them, but there's no medications as of now. But the idea that we could possibly decrease the progression, exercise the only one that we think can do that. In addition to physical therapy, there's also occupational therapy. And Dr. Poston talked about this yesterday as well. They sound similar. Um, physical therapy is more kind of walking, mobility, and gait. Whereas occupational therapy, the way I think the difference is, it's more like everyday life. You know, everyday life, drinking, dressing, cooking, um, kind of everyday life things. We call them activities of daily living. Another thing they do that I think is very important is that it's not just kind of learning how to do daily life things better. It's also about how to make your house or your home safer. So there's different kinds of agencies for occupational or physical therapy that will do home safety evaluations. And that's really important too. Um, someone to actually come by your house, they usually come one or two times and they just give you suggestions. Suggestions on how to make your house safer. And some of these things aren't always so obvious. So one is, for example, throw rugs. They, they are very beautiful, um, but they're actually they're fall risk, right? So different kinds of throw. Even carpet, carpet length. Not that I'm saying you should overhaul <laughs> your house, but that's just something to know. Even the, the carpet length is too long. It just has a higher chance of falls. Even clutter in a certain part of the house. Where to put grip bars? Should we put them, of course, in the bathroom? But are they also okay in other places of the house? So it's just ideas. They give you ideas on how to make your house more safe. In addition to that, also early on, not just only doing PT and OT, which is physical therapy and occupational therapy, but early on also doing speech therapy. So speech therapy, what they do is kind of really work on how to enunciate your voice and increase the volume of voice through speech exercises. It's kind of like singing lessons. <laughs> it's kind of like seeing like how are you going to project your voice. And I would suggest this earlier on than, than later. In addition to that, the last kind of motor symptom I think of in terms of um, taking care of MSA is something called dystonia. So dystonia is an involuntary uh, muscle contraction. It can be toe curling, it can be arm flexion, uh, moving like this. There's different ones. Does it happen all the time? No, but it can. And so it's something just to make, just to mention um, if you think something like that is going on. There's different kinds of medications that actually can help with that. Um, however, sometimes we can use something called botulinum toxin. So botulinum toxin is more famous for kind of wrinkles and you know all, all those things. But what it also can do is actually it paralyzes muscles. So when you paralyze muscles, you can kind of release that involuntary contraction a little bit more and give a little bit more comfort. So when you think of that last motor symptom, just just checking, do you have any involuntary toe curling, arm flexion, um, kind of this contraction, something to think about in terms of trying to make it more comfortable. So when you think of motor symptoms, of course, very important. That's my checklist that I think of with every appointment, making sure I check all those things. But not only that, what's also very important is making sure mood, um, having counseling as well as having a good social support system. Um, so part of my checklist, 
just checking and screening for any type of mood. Depression can occur, frustration, these are common in multiple system atrophy. There are different kinds of medications for it, but I'm not always for let's go straight to medications. There's always other different ways too as well, whether it be psychology, you know, counseling, and I don't just mean even individual counseling, I also mean um, even family counseling. You can imagine that this of course affects everyone um, in the unit, not just the patient. Um, and so the last part that actually I think is probably one of the very important parts of um, taking care of someone with MSA is always checking in with the caretaker. Um, the caretaker, as you know, not only our confidant, our friend, but definitely our advocates. So, so before I move on, actually, who here is a caretaker, or family member, or Fantastic. So before we go on, let's look at you. Let's, let's do a second. Let's give a round of applause for our wonderful care. Let's give them a hug. Give them a hug, you know. Because <laughs> they're the ones, because <laughs> they're the ones engaged. They're the ones advocating for us. They're the ones here trying to learn more. What I would say about um, caretakers is that we know more and more, and there's more national studies about this, is that when caretakers and families are taken care of, the patient does better too. So whether it be dementia scores, quality of life scores, these are things that already is known. So that last part of taking care of the caretakers is very important. Now, of course, I know that as a physician, you want 85% of my attention to the patient. But that 15% is something I take seriously during every appointment, just making sure how is the family unit doing. Now caregiver burnout is something very nationally known um, in the sense that you know universities are taking on, there's lots of classes, um, there's lots of um, websites, YouTube channels. Um, it's definitely something becoming a, which I love to see that's a national effort. Now personally, I also was a caretaker um, for my grandmother who had a neurological disease. And so that was something I, I know what it feels like, personally. I know what it feels like in the sense that, you know, as your role as a caretaker or family member, this is not your only role. All of us are parents, siblings, we have work, we have school. At the time, I was a grad student. I was also applying to med school. I was taking care of my little brother, and I was had a part-time job <laughs> trying to make rent. And so, but at the same time, it was also my job to take care of my grandmother at night. And so, but at the same time, I wouldn't have a, changed that experience for anything else. I think it made me a better doctor. It makes me very in tune to the caretakers. I was that person. I know that feeling where you feel, you go to the doctor, people ask you, how are you doing? I'm fine, I'm fine, you know? <laughs> There's that survival mode we're in. And that's normal, but at the same time, what I love about that's different being in medicine now is that we're more in tune into the caretakers. So I do say, one, continue to take care of each other, but take care of yourself as well. Thank you so much. So what we'll do now is, uh, thank you. What we'll do now, oh, thanks. <laughs>